and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm thrilled that you are taking some of your time to join us this week where we're going to talk about board games and the people who play them. Hey, we have been doing a lot of live stuff on our channel lately. We've been doing it both on our channel and on the Twitch channel, which by the way is The Dice Tower. And if you want to know when that stuff is happening, make sure you check out DiceTowerLive.com. Also, check out our website. There's a lot of stuff on our regular website, DiceTower.com our reviews, you can vote on our top 10 list, and there's a lot of exciting things that are coming soon from us. Uh, I also want to remind you about Dice Tower Con. Man, I'm so excited about some of the stuff that we're doing there. I've been scheduling events and getting things ready for that. It's gonna be a lot of fun. You're definitely gonna wanna come. There's only a couple hundred tickets left, so you make sure you wanna get one of those. Go to DiceTowerCon.com. And the cruise is also almost sold out, so if you wanna get a Dice Tower Cruise ticket, yeah, you probably have weeks, really, to do that. Okay, well, beyond all that, man, we got some news, so let's get to it. All right, so first of all, there is a new game that's coming out called Welcome 2. This is from Deep Water Games, although the original game is from Blue Cocker Games. Deep Water Games is the one bringing it to America. This is a roll-and-write city-building style game. Roll-and-write is definitely the hottest trend in gaming where you're writing down on papers. You know, everyone's writing that thing down. Think of Yahtzee if you don't know what one is. That's a roll-and-write game. Uh, so looking forward to seeing this one out. I do like this genre a lot. Uh... Christopher Bollinger, I talked about him last week in my best of list. Uh, he has a new game coming out called An uh, Ankama, or I'm sorry, Brothers. Brothers, it's coming from the company Ankama. That's all we know about it. It's a 15-minute game, but it looks really fun. I really like the artwork for this one. A Gloomhaven expansion has been announced. He did this big whole puzzly type aspect. Uh, one of them even went up on our Facebook page. Uh, called The Forgotten Circle. This is 20 new scenarios that basically take place after the main Gloomhaven campaign. There's more monsters. There's even a whole new class, a diviner, coming. So Gloomhaven fans rejoice. This is not coming to Kickstarter. You're just going to get this one through normal uh, methods distribution. Fantasy Flight has made quite a few announcements. First of all, they're starting a, a new expansion for the Arkham Horror card game, Forgotten Age. It starts a new cycle in that game. Uh, Mansions of Madness, The Sanction of Twilight, bringing the Twilight Lodge into that amazing game. And the Game of Thrones card game has eight intro decks coming for it. And they're doing some reworking of that. And then finally, the, the Legend of the Five Rings, they're going to be releasing six of the living card packs in six weeks. They did this initially when the game came out. It was like six packs, six weeks. Normally they do like a pack a month or so. And here it was just like, boom. Now they're doing it again. This seems like a weird idea to me to do this. To vomit out that much content that quickly. Seems like it's overwhelming to fans to get all that. Because the fans, the living card game was, put a little bit of money in each month. Here, you can't do that anymore. We'll see what happens. Uh, we also know that uh, IDW has Joust coming out. They've been making games based on Atari. Uh, the ancient Atari ones. This one, of course... We'll probably get some attention because Joust is featured in the Ready Player One book. Z-Man is bringing back a couple of quote-unquote classic games, even though I dislike both these games, but a lot of people do. The first one is Taj Mahal. This is yet another in uh, the Kinesia series that they're bringing back his stuff. And even though I'm not a fan of it, it's very highly rated. It's a big game of chicken, essentially. Uh, with, and, the, and the new production of this from Z-Man does look phenomenal. And then a game called Fae. This is from Leo Calavini. It's a reworking of a game called Clans, which back in the day was a game that a lot of people really liked, kind of a gateway style game. I found it too abstract for my tastes, but we'll have to see how it looks, especially with the new uh, overlay and the graphics and everything like that. All right, you know, it seems like my part of the news these days is not nearly as exciting as Suzanne's part, so let's get to hers. Happy breakfast, everybody. 
Whether you are catching dreams or dodging fireballs, we have quite the selection in today's crowdfunding roundup, so let's get going. Van Ryder Games is releasing a collection of graphic novel adventure books. Imagine combining a choose-your-own-adventure book with a graphic novel, and then integrating an RPG, and that's what these books are all about. Intended as a solo game experience, these books offer a visually immersive experience with virtually zero setup and multiple paths to explore. You'll get a character sheet and choose some basic stats, and as you go through the adventure, you'll encounter challenges, lose time, and more. This campaign offers five different books that vary in art style and setting, from a bounty hunter tracking down sacred sprouts to a western to a classic Sherlock Holmes setting. You can pick a single book for $19 plus shipping, or you can get the full set of graphic novel adventures for $75 plus shipping. In Decca Slayer, 10 calamitous monsters are threatening the kingdom. Guilds from each region form to fight them off, but each guild has its own agenda too. Work your way through the beasts until you finally face that dragon. Players use hero cards to defeat the monsters by aligning unique traits, planning ahead for the hero card draft, and being flexible because different monsters demand you play cards in different player order and they can be defeated through different card criteria. Victory brings treasure cards for points, but some also have abilities that you can leverage in future rounds. Decca Slayer plays three to six people, is designed by two of the best known game designers from Japan, Hizashi Hayashi and Seiji Kanai, and a copy of Decca Slayer takes a pledge of 3,200 yen, which is about 30 US dollars, plus shipping. In Dreamscape, you work to collect shards that are basically discs that represent water, land, rock, and grass that you can use to search for happy dream views. Manage your resources carefully as you're limited on what you can collect and carry as you move through the dream world. And those are extra important because shards help you move between areas and they also activate dream card powers. There's an advanced game that incorporates Mr. Nightmare, who leaves shards behind that will hit you for negative points when you collect them. Ultimately, Dreamscape is an interestingly themed abstract game as you work to plan to collect those resource discs so that you can align them with the dream card patterns, including stacking them on top of each other. You can get Dreamscape for a pledge of 45 euro plus shipping. Highways and Byways was inspired by the real-life road trip the designer once took with his brother. Using hand management and a bit of light card drafting, players work to complete their road trip through the byways and return home. Of course, you'll need a car for the trip, and each vehicle has a special ability to add a little bit of player variability. Plan your route using your byway cards, and you'll ultimately use movement points to try and complete the trip. But construction cards and events will muck with your plans and opponents get to play those on you and vice versa. But be careful about what you use and what you save because your hand of cards will get passed around. Designer Brandon Rollins has successfully delivered on a previous campaign and Highways and Byways is a family weight game with a fun theme that you can get a copy of for a pledge of $49 plus shipping. In Unbroken, you play an avenging warrior, scrapping together resources to make a weapon. You'll build up your character and conquer your way through four monsters, each more difficult than the last. Using just a few trackers, Unbroken is a card-driven solo game in which you draw encounters and follow a course of action based on one of them. Time ticks down, so you'll only get so many encounters to prepare for your battle with a monster. With four characters to select from and 24 different monster cards that mix and match, there's a ton of replayability in Unbroken. You can get a copy of this dark fantasy solo game for a pledge of 25 Canadian dollars plus shipping. And last but not least, Restoration Games is bringing the 80s classic plastic behemoth Fireball Island back to life with Fireball Island, The Curse of Volcar. Full disclosure, I support restoration behind the scenes on a freelance basis, but ultimately I chose to cover this project because it's totally something I would cover whether I had that association or not. Fireball Island has been restored from the board up, but designed to retain the marble mayhem of the original game. The game board is taller and longer, using three stacking trays to form it. There are new pathways, movement rules, wind conditions, and even more marbles.
There are three optional expansions available in the campaign, including a fifth player expansion and a shipwreck area. But a base copy of Fireball Island, The Curse of Volcar, takes a pledge of $60 plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hello guys, I'm Cardboard Rhino and welcome to Rhino Says Yes. Today I want to show you a different kind of game which is basically an escape room in a box. It's Exit the Abandoned Cabin. So the story starts with you and your friends happily going on vacations when suddenly your car breaks down. It's late at night and it starts to rain heavily so you leave the car and you try to find some shelter. You find an abandoned cabin in the woods and you stay there for the night. But in the morning when you wake up the door is locked with a combination lock. In front of you there is a book and a strange disc like a decoder. It dawns on you that you will not be able to leave the cabin until you have worked together to solve a series of riddles and open the lock. But you have to hurry because the creepy host might return. The game, apart from the booklet and the disc, has some riddle cards that come up slowly during the game, some extra items and the answer cards. There's also the help cards which give you hints which you can totally use but the more you get of them the less stars you get as evaluation of completing the game. To check your answers for a lock combination you go to the symbol of the riddle you want to solve, you enter the three digits of the combination and this little window sends you to the answer card to see whether your guess was correct or if you have to keep trying. I cannot show you more than this because I don't want to spoil the game for you but what I can tell you is that it's going to be two intense hours or less if you're good at it where you have to put your heads together use your creativity and powers of deduction to crack codes and you can literally cut the clues and try to make sense of them I like the fact that the game doesn't tell you much about what you need to do and when you just know that there is about 10 lock combinations to solve until you can open the final door so it really feels like an escape room where you get in and you have no clue where to look for your next clue. You can only play this game once, obviously, but it's rather cheap to buy, so I think it's worth it. So Rhino says yes to exit. You should gather your friends and give it a go. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Love, but it's a love and not living. I am. Two. Two. What are you doing? What? What are you doing, man? That love boat, obviously. Why are you singing that song? That's the theme song to Love Boat. No, dude, that's Love Shack by B-52s. What's loving about a shack? That's where you're going to get murdered. Why are you in the water right now? It's Love Boat, not Love Sled. The hat. It's Love Boat. It's all about being fancy on a boat. I gotta bring my fancy hat. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go now. You don't wanna play? No. Right. You leave. All right. Two, three, four. Love Boat! All right, so this is Love Boat, the world cruise game. So much love going on in this world that we gotta make a game about it. So the first thing you're gonna do is choose a star passenger. So you can choose someone like Professor Higgins. So basically, you're gonna be rolling a die. <laughs> Mike's laughing. And then you go all these, these stupid little bits, and then if you land on a, a magenta one, you draw a cruise card. Now again, you have a specific person, so you have to then choose if you think What's on this is gonna be good for your person because they all have specific character stuff on the back. You do great at this. <laughs> so if I wanna play backhand with this man right here, do I think that's something Suzanne Superstar would wanna do? You have to decide. You don't have to choose one of these cards if you don't want to. I'm gonna go for it. Oh, Suzanne Superstar is down here. Opponent dazzled by your beauty. You win easily. Obviously, 50 points. And then you just keep going around on the thing until the first person reaches San Francisco. Once you do that, you see who um, guessed the best. So that was Love Boat. Boat love. love. Boat. Look at the boat. Look at that boat. It's full of love. It's based on a, a TV show on an endless cruise, I guess. I don't. I don't know. Don't I've know never the love seen boat. The Love Boat. I don't care. Anyway, this game is terrible. <gasps> Spoiler alert. And I like the idea of like, oh, like you have a specific character. Your specific character is gonna be better at certain things. Like if you're really conservative, you're not gonna like parties. So like, look at the picture of the card you're about get to grab. Get an idea. Get an idea to see if you want to take that card or not. But like, it made no, it made sense. no sense. It was, it was, uh, oh man, it was a slog getting through this one. <laughs> it was rough. All right, dudes and dudettes, do check us out on the social media, especially right here on YouTube. Until next time.
We'll see you on dry land, not anywhere near the love boat. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? I'll be taking a look at um, several games. Sam and I are going to be doing some Miami Dice reviews. Uh, Thunderstone Quest, which you saw us play live a couple weeks ago. We'll be reviewing that. Iquazu, um, the new game from uh, Haba. And then I'll be taking a look at my uh, Xybred, uh, several kids games we'll be reviewing this week. Sam and Z are going to continue their series of live playthroughs of Arkham Horror the Card Game and The Memoir 44. Uh, I'm going to be doing my top 10 uh, designers, best of designers. I'll be doing James Ernest and Mike Fitzgerald, so you have that to look forward to. Uh, Eric and I have a new podcast dropping on Tuesday. We're going to be starting off an educational type series, and this will be our top 10 games that teach math. So we'll be doing that. We'll be doing science and history and English as time goes by. Hopefully that will be useful to many folks. And there's a lot of other podcasts, of course, being released all the time, and you can find those on DicetowerNetwork.com. Let's keep moving. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. One particular style of game that's particularly popular among solitaire gamers is cooperative games. And primarily the reason for this is that they are inherently easy to be played solitaire. Certain cooperative games you can play with just one character. Other cooperative games you might need to control multiple characters, but you can pretty easily play almost all cooperative games solitaire. However, there is a subset of cooperative games where that's not necessarily the case, and those are called semi-cooperative games. The general idea behind a semi-cooperative game is that all of the players are working towards some particular common goal, but there's going to ultimately be a single winner or everybody will lose. And what brought this to mind was a game that I just played this week called Hope. Hope is a semi-cooperative game where all the players are trying to work towards a particular goal. In this case, you're trying to terraform uh, planets in a galaxy, and you're trying to do this before uh, what is somewhat of a timer goes off. And if you can complete your mission as a cooperative team, and you can terraform enough planets before the timer runs out, then the whole team will be successful, but there'll be one winner, whoever has terraformed the most planets. Now, when I played it solitaire, I didn't really play it as a semi-co-op. I just played as two characters and tried to terraform enough planets before the timer ran out. Now, you treated it kind of as a cooperative race game. But what this got me to thinking about was semi-co-ops in general. This seems to be a bit of a divisive topic, at least from what I've seen and read. Semi-co-ops are, in many cases, looked at as being almost broken by some people. I've seen a lot of very strongly worded comments about how semi-co-ops just don't tend to work. And so I'd like to get your opinions on this. Those of you that have played semi-cooperative games, what are the ones that have worked? What are the ones that haven't worked? And, and maybe why? Do you think this is a type of game that just by its very nature doesn't work well? Or do you think that maybe they've been misunderstood? If you can let me know in the comments below, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Hey there, everyone. It's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with this week's segment of From the Page to the Table. So what exactly am I wearing today? Well, if you're familiar with Terry Goodkind's series, The Sword of Truth, this outfit I'm wearing today is inspired by Kalen M. Nell and Wizard's First Rule. It's a book series that came at a pivotal point in my life and my husband's, and it started us both on a journey into the fantasy realm, most specifically my husband and his fantasy writing series. Kaylin is a character for me that develops over time. She's a strong warrior woman. She uh, serves justice, and I feel like I identify a lot with her. Uh, this outfit is more specifically inspired by the TV show, not Kaylin from the book. So there's a lot of things that I could have paired this book series with in the fantasy board games. There's so many behind me, so many. My husband and I had a rather engaging conversation over Defenders of the Realm and X, Y, and Z, but came to the conclusion that Legends of Andor by the immeasurable Michael Menzel, designed and illustrated by him, it was the best fit. Here's why. It's got this epic feeling that captures the feeling of the book. You're on these missions, you have an ultimate goal, and a really 
the time is just ticking, 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 ticking as you're going through the game. Wonderful artwork, really great gameplay, and it's cooperative as well. Two to four players, 60 to 90 minutes, and published by Cosmos in the most recent edition. Love both of them, and love Wizards First Rule. I'll see you next week. What's up everyone, I'm Danny. And I'm Derek, and this is You, you Bet Your, your Bippy. Bippy. In this segment, we're gonna give you some fun facts about a particular game so you can strike up a conversation at your next game night. And this week's game is... Santorini. Santorini is an abstract strategy game where you are using your workers to move around the board and build these big buildings trying to get onto the top before your opponent puts on those iconic blue domes to block you. Hey Danny. What's up? Did you know that the Greek island of Santorini is the product of many volcanic eruptions over the course of Earth's history? Are you serious? You bet your bippy. Its location may be actually the neighbor to the lost city, the infamous city of Atlantis. Wow. Well Derek, did you know that Santorini had a lot of different names before? They're all different Greek names, mm -hmm. but the name itself was given by the Venetians through the Church of St. Irene. So if you say St. Irene, Sant, Santa Irene, Santorini. Santorini. Oh. And also, did you know that the iconic blue dome buildings are located in the city of Ia, but that's spelled O-I-A yeah. in Greece, Ia. Yeah. And did you know that those same buildings are actually all religious buildings, not houses or anything, and also that the colors of the facade represent the colors of the Greek flag? Blue, white, blue dome, white building. You have got to be kidding me. You bet your bippy. Now, did you know any of those fun facts about Santorini? Or did you have any fun facts of your own you'd like to share with us? Please do so in the comments below. And make sure you follow us all over social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And we will see you next week. Happy breakfast, everybody. Make sure you eat your Wheaties. Hey, hello there, and welcome to another Adventures of a Gnome Board Gamer, where my friend Jess and I travel around the country, and I teach Jesse a new game every week. Right. Which game did we play this week? Well, we played uh, Century Spice Road, and that was an intriguing game. I, I really liked it. Yeah, what you, did you like the card system, or what, what, what was attractive? Because I know you, you said good words about the game. Uh, well, it's it's you play with the cards, but... You have to develop a little bit of the strategy, and it's not dependent on dice rolls. Yeah. If you're not familiar with Center Spice Road, uh, you have a system where you have to play cards to acquire different cubes, which are basically the spices. And those spices are used to buy uh, cards that are worth points. You also acquire cards that will give you trade and other things, right? So you have yeah. never played a card drafting game before, have you? Not really. So tell me a little bit about the game. Did you, did you like specific things on the game? No, it was just the fact that, that there were a lot of things that you had to strategize in order to gain points, and uh, it made it interesting, to say the least. Uh, once you understood the game, and at first it took a while till we got it off the ground, but um, you know the trading trading for more spices or buying cards or selling spices, you know, it was quite interesting. This game is kind of thematic for Jess and I. Jess and I have traveled Asia like in the Middle East a little bit together. And we actually have been to real spice silks together and it, it brought some memories for me at least that when yeah. we were there, like yeah. all the saffron and the cinnamon. We <laughs> have cinnamon. Uh, turmeric. In turmeric, there. yeah. yeah. Turmeric. Turmeric. Thanks again for watching and uh, hope to see you guys again next week. Happy breakfast, everybody. Happy breakfast. <laughs> breakfast. One of the games I mentioned earlier that I'm reviewing this week is Thunderstone Quest. And someone said, what are you going to do with Thunderstone Advance now that you're getting Thunderstone Quest? And Thunderstone Advance is right down here. I have it in two different boxes and I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to get rid of it and replace it with a new one. 
And someone mentioned on a thread, and they said, well, Tom, that's easy for you to do because you didn't buy the game, so it's easy for you to replace it. But someone who's invested a lot of money into a game is not going to want to replace it, or it's an expensive thing to replace it. And this is a very fair point, right? Uh, I often kind of get on people's case when they get upset over a second edition coming out because I always say it doesn't invalidate the fun you have with your first edition. You know, you're not sitting there, Fantasy Flight, who's kind of notorious for making second, thirds, and even fourth editions. You know, um, they're not going to show up at your house and be like, oh, we made a second edition, you need to return the first one. And it's also not quite... Uh, along the same lines of, well, you have this app on your phone or something and now it doesn't work anymore and you need to get the new one. Uh, or it's not being supported. But there is some slight parallels to that because let's say you have a game Runebound and you like Runebound and it had lots of expansions and you were excited to see the new expansion and then you find out that there's a new edition and the expansions that come out after that do not work with your base game. So I can, I, I can feel the frustration there Although, again, I'll say it does not, again, make the original game that you have go obsolete. But it can feel obsolete, especially when everyone's talking about how great the new edition is. Although there will always be diehards who say the old editions are better, I sometimes think that they just don't want to get rid of those games. So, yes, it can be a costly thing if they come out with a new edition of a game. You're like, all right, fine, I'll get rid of the old one. And it can be even more difficult because selling the old one can be a hard sell. But like, hey, you want to buy Twilight Imperium 3? Like, isn't Twilight Imperium 4 out now? Sure, but this one's amazing. Then why are you getting rid of it? So I can buy Twilight Imperium 4. <laughs> now, sure, you'll find people who will want the older editions of a game. But yeah, the market drops out instantly. That's why you see people complaining who invest in older games. And sometimes a newer game will come along and they're upset because... Well, now the value of their older game has dropped tremendously. So, so what to do in this circumstance? Well, you really have some options, right? Your options are to play the older game, enjoy the older game, run it to the ground, get your money's worth out of it. You could try to find someone to sell it to and use it to get a new one. For me, the analogy here is kind of like a car. I have a pretty junky Toyota Corolla right now that I need to get rid of. And I keep looking at it going, I need to get rid of it, but I, you know, I put money in this car. I don't want to buy a new car. I have to buy a whole new car. And if I sell this Toyota Corolla, it's not going to bring me a lot of money. You're right. That's how life is. The difference here being, I have to get a new car at some point. Okay, I can't. Living in Florida, things are too far apart. Public transportation is not good enough. I have to have a vehicle to be able to get around. I don't have to have the new edition of a game. I know, I know, I know. Here we are in a board game breakfast saying such things. But we don't have to have the newest edition of a game. So I, it's not like, ah, oh, this Twilight Imperium 3rd edition isn't working anymore. We got upgraded to Twilight 4th. You know, it's just, no, you don't have to do that. And so, sure, it's a thing. But when it comes down to it, I would rather a company make these new editions because they can make them, they can learn from them. And of course, you can argue that some companies make a first edition and a second edition comes out really close to the first one. And it's like, why did you not make some of those fixes, you know, on the first one? However, there comes a point where that's a ridiculous argument too. For example, we'll go back to Twilight Imperium 4th edition, which came out 10 years after the third one. That's not too soon. This Thunderstone quest has come out, what, five or six years after Thunderstone Advance. They're not putting them right on top of each other. And I'm glad to see changes. I like to see new things. We uh, Board game design is almost like technology. We're seeing new things added to it all the time, and you can make things better. And while there are some people out there who will tell you that newer editions of games are worse than the old ones, that is a rarity. They're almost always better. They're almost always better graphic, component-wise. This is not Hasbro stuff we're talking about. Um, uh, Gameplay-wise, they streamline things, they make things better. So you don't need the new stuff, but it is nice to upgrade once in a while. And so I've upgraded a few of my things. There are things that I have uh, bought the new versions of because the old versions, you know, I, I, I want to have the newest thing and then I get rid of the old one. Sometimes I give it away. Sometimes I sell it for, of course, a fraction of the price. But that's how I feel about it. Tell me what you think in the comments. Let's keep going. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netters Plays. And today on Apply Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Onitama. So this is an abstract game for only two players, and the exchange of movement cards is what makes this game different and unique. 
So let me show you a little bit about this game and why I really like it. So here you have the setup of the game. You're going to shuffle up your movement cards and then you're going to deal two movement cards face up in front of each player. You'll also draw one card between both players face up. Since that face up card has the blue symbol, the blue player starts. So on a player's turn, you can move your pieces however which way the cards tell you how to move. So for example, this card will tell me that the black area is where your piece is located and the blue area is however way you can move one of your pieces, whether it being your student pieces or even your masterpiece. So once you make your movement, then you're going to use this card and exchange it with the middle card. This card will now become yours for next turn. There are only two ways of winning the game. The first way is that you can capture your master by moving onto the space where they're located, or your master can land at the entrance to your opponent's temple. So as you can see, this game offers only two ways of winning. Either you can capture your opponent's pieces, or you can move your masterpiece from one end of the board to the other. However, every time you use a movement card, you're offering it to your opponent. And that's where the complexity of the game comes because you want to make sure you use it at the right time. So that's why I really like Onitama. Well, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, I'm Anthony. And I'm Francis. Welcome to AntLab Games Office Hours. It's a short segment where we go over the finer points of board gaming. All right. So the finer point that we chose for today hmm. is actually a mechanic. Oh yeah? Pickup and delivery. Pickup and delivery. One of my favorites. Yes, indeed. And what favorites. exactly is pickup and delivery? Well, Board Game Geek defines pickup and delivery as a mechanic that requires players to pick up an item or good at one location on the board and deliver it to another location on the board. So essentially... So pretty self-explanatory. I pick things up and put things down. <laughs> Supposedly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, with that said, um, so pick up and delivery, right? So you, you have an item, you need to take it somewhere yes. on the board, and you need to deliver it somewhere, right? Usually fulfillment of contract, mm -hmm. right? So one game we've chosen that really showcases this mechanic, pick up ah. and delivery, uh, happens to be in our collection, Oracle of Delphi. Yes. Right, that game is just all about pick and delivery. Right? All right, so um, one one of kind of the deliverables that we wanted for you guys was to provide a couple of tips that at least we find um, helpful yep. with these certain kinds of mechanics. So uh, for pick and delivery, what would you say would be one quick tip? Okay, quick tip for the folks. Okay, so of YouTube. my personal strategy going into a pick and delivery game when it's, when it's core pick and delivery is. Getting contracts and looking for certain routes along the path, picking up as many items as I can carry, and ensuring that I have the required rec goods or what have you mm -hmm. to hit multiple stops along the way to the furthest location, right. drop off location, right? So, so efficiency. That, uh, exactly. Okay. Good. Um, and if I had a tip, I actually have like kind of two part, right? So, okay. number one, do not get caught up in a single delivery. Get it um, done. Number two is to not consider every game that has pickup and delivery mm -hmm. to be a pickup and delivery game. True. So even if you see this mechanic in a game, um, don't don't expect that that's how you're going to get all of your points because a lot of times it's kind of just thrown on there. Okay. So you are wise people. I'm wise meeple. Indeed. <laughs> so if you like the pickup and delivery mechanic, Oracle Delphi is a good start. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan, the river yeah. delivery yes. game. Yeah, that's a good one too. So there's plenty of them out there. Go check them out on Borga Geep. I think that's all the time we have today. It's probably the quickest thing you've ever seen from yep, us. So. So, <laughs> I'm Anthony. I'm Francis. We're from Antlab Games. See you next time. See ya. Happy breakfast, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the Godfather Colleone's Empire and why I think the Godfather theming actually lets the game down. So the gameplay itself, I have no problem with. You're placing your thugs to go and shake up the front of a business to try and extort some money or illegal goods. You're then placing your family members to control areas that you kind of get almost protection money from the back of the shops. And then there's the job and illegal good cards. Now the illegal goods are just kind of plain and boring. They're coloured just to make them a bit different and the symbols are different, but they're just that. Then the job cards 
they all have this artwork on. It doesn't matter what the job is, it could be a car bomb, it's still that artwork. There's, the theming is what's going on, but the picture, the illustration that goes with it is just meh. Don't get me wrong, there's some nice touches. The first player marker is a horse's head. But if that's all the game is offering me from the theme, other than the Mafia, why have the sort of expensive branding of the Godfather at all? So that's one time I think the theming has caused the game to cost too much, and actually doesn't add anything that a more generic Mafia theme wouldn't have done just as well. Let me know if you agree or disagree in the comments section below, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason with The Family Showdown. Each week on By The Numbers we look at a numeric board game related topic. This week's topic is the Board Game Geek Top 100 representative of the cult of the new. Board Game Geek is a massive database of games. Their Top 100 games could be considered one representation of the best games of all time. But is their top 100 representative of the cult of the new? And by cult of the new, we mean the people that are chasing the hotness, chasing the new games, always looking for that next game, what's new and great. Take a look at this handy dandy chart. You see the bulk of the games have been published in recent years. In fact, two thirds of the games have been published since 2012. In fact, one of the games, Rising Sun, was published in 2018, has already made the list. And then you go all the way down the list to Crokinole in 1896. Crazy. Looking at this chart, you see that one year recently looks a little strange. 2013 13, is a little lower than the other years. That's also the year I became heavy in board games again. Coincidence? I think not. So is the Board Game Geek Top 100 representative of the cult of the new? Hmm, maybe, but more likely it's representative of the growing popularity of board games in recent years. See you next time. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. In a previous episode, I took a family favorite, Azul, and created Azul Scrabble Edition. In this episode, I'm going to show you how I did that. The first thing you're going to want to do is go online, either eBay or Amazon, and pick out the Scrabble colors of the tiles that you're going to want to correspond with the board. I use yellow over yellow, I use the orange over the red, the black over the black, the wood clear, or whatever that color is, over the stars, and of course the blue over the blue. The next thing you're going to want to do is take those Scrabble pieces and put the corresponding colors over the colors on this board. And then we're going to take a picture of this entire board as is so we can print it out next. Because I wanted an extra large printout, I had to print it on two separate pages like this and then I'll be able to cut them out separately and glue them together onto the backing that I'm going to use. After cutting it out, you need to find some kind of a backer board that you want to use. So looking around my house, I found these 12 inch by 12 inch bathroom tiles, just linoleum or something, plastic. But I thought, hey, let's give this a try. So I peeled off the back, which is quite a bit sticky. And then I carefully placed these on here because you want to make sure you place them correctly the first time. And of course, this is all sticky. You're going to want to cut this off all the way around, either using scissors or a carpet knife of some sort. Now, you're probably wondering, why didn't I just put it off to the edge so I only had to cut two parts? Well, I learned that the edges are beveled and they're a little sticky. And I didn't want sticky edges on the edge of on the player boards here. And after cutting, you have a really nice player board. And like I said, I did mine a little larger because I wanted to be able to make sure there's plenty of room for these letters to fit on there. After you have all of your Scrabble pieces, that's gonna be 500 of them because you bought five different colors, you need to separate 20 of each color out. I use the same letter distribution as the traditional Scrabble game, so there's only two H's and I think there's like eight or nine E's. And how I started that was like this. I created a paper and I went down each one and started 
making sure that the totals came to right. But then, ultimately, this is what I ended up with. And there you have it, a Zoll Scrabble Edition. Sometimes when you want to do a board game makeover, it's just a matter of finding the pieces you need around your house. Like these were extra tile pieces. And if you don't have any extras, take one out of the bathroom. No one will ever know. But this is how I made a Zoll Scrabble Edition. Thanks for watching the board game makeover. I will see you next time. Hello, it's Matthew here. I'm trying something different this week. A, this, B, filming a video in one take, because I'm great at that. Last week I spoke about, well, two weeks ago, I spoke about the, my favourite card games, how I'm going to bring them to you, the people. But the best thing I need to talk to you first about is the best way to shuffle cards. So here we go. First way to shuffle cards, and the best way, is to riffle shuffle. Do that seven times, you have a completely randomised deck of cards, which is great, but you might also have bent cards. Not so great. So the second way you can shuffle is by taking a few and doing this. So riffle shuffling takes... Oh, there we go. Riffle shuffling takes seven times. That kind of motion takes 10,000 times to randomise a deck. Super not cool. Third way is to smush. If you smush cards for, you know, about a minute, you get a fairly randomised deck of cards. But smushing for a minute doesn't sound like much fun, unless you're into that. In which case, it sounds great. Last thing you can do is this. Where you do this, you take one card and you put it in. You take one card and you put it in at random. When the card you had on the bottom is now on the top, you have a completely randomised deck. So the card on the bottom is the Ten of Clubs. When that comes to the top and then goes into the middle, one card at a time, completely random deck. And you might think that's brilliant, but how much does that take? It takes maths. It takes log 52 times log 52, which is about 100 taking a card and smushing it in. So the best way, just riffle, riffle shuffle, riffle shuffle your cards. They might get like a little bit bent, but honestly, everything else is just the height of tedium. And I include this video. Have a great week. This was weird, wasn't it? Was this weird? A little bit weird. I liked it. Hey, Tom. Um... I just wanted to take some time and uh, give you my thoughts on something that I think you're wrong about. And that's the fact that you think that Century is a Splendor Killer. Now, while I think Century is overall the better game, um, you know, component-wise, art-wise, um, table presence, especially if you have the mat, which I do, um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have Splendor in your gaming library, especially, you know, um, as a family gamer like myself. Um, I had my eight-year-old niece um, play Century, and uh, she didn't really grasp the uh, upgrade system with the cards and the gems. Um, it just didn't click with her. Whereas Splendor, um, you know, we had a four-player game of Splendor, and she she won. She dominated. So, um, I'll actually say I agree with you in that um, this should have won the Spill of Jaris instead of Camel Up. But, um, I don't think this kills Splendor. I think they, you know, you're allowed to have both in one's gaming library and, uh, you know, and should have it in, in your gaming library, especially, um, you know, if you're family or gamer. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, what can I say? This time you got me. Uh, I still think Century is the better game, right? But I'm looking here at my shelf, and right there is Splendor, and right there is Century Spice Road. And I don't keep that many games, right? I get thousands of games. Most of them do not stay in my collection, and yet both those games do. So I guess I think Century is a better game, but it hasn't killed Splendor since it's sitting right there, and I bring that one out also when playing games of people. What do you know? Folks, do you have a Tom is Wrong segment? Definitely send it in, and I will play them. I don't care what you say. Uh, put it up. Tell me what's wrong with me and my opinions. I, I don't know if I necessarily went to what's wrong with me. But anyhow, thanks so much for watching another episode of Board Game Breakfast. We always appreciate you guys. Uh, we appreciate... 
Uh, the listeners, I want to say a huge thank you as always to the contributors. They do such a fantastic job and it's always exciting to see where we'll go next from here and to see how the Dice Tower has changed over the past years and such. Hey! We are, we're going into April here. Spring is upon us. Um, flowers are blooming. New games are being announced. But there's still, even if there wasn't, there's still many, many wonderful games to play. Go out, play some. I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Mm-hmm.